the chairman of the branch. But there were agitations that the elections were not free and fair. So they petitioned the national body. The national body said, okay, what we're going to do is to reconduct an election. So they set up a category committee that came here. And they also tried to compile the list of eligible voters. And certain persons were agitating that the lists compiled were not proper. So they took it back to national, and the national sat on it. Until when the branch said, no, we've been in limbo for a long time. Let's come back together and see how we can move the branch forward. Well, some, some people, uh, some of your colleagues, uh, seem to uh, have this impression that um, the crisis was due to the poor performance of uh, the previous executive and that there was uh, some degree of uh, impunity. Well, the truth is that I mean, an association, particularly where you have people who are learned, people are entitled to their different opinions. But if you had a problem with the past administration, you should take steps to also investigate the past administration and not to create, not to create confusion at the end of the day. So it would not be right for anybody to say it was caused by the past administration because of impunity. The, they did their things, the meetings hold regular, held regularly, and um, there were investigations. Normally, if a system is coming to an end, there will be an audit committee. They were also audited, and those issues never came up until after the elections. That was a subterfuge to challenge the cost of election. Let's, let's listen to this clip uh, briefly, and maybe that will also uh, help you to uh, put your answer in proper perspective. I appreciate that. Please, let's, um, producer, please, let's have uh, uh, that clip. What happened is that some people didn't want to implement NBA constitutional bylaw. And some others said, no, we are insisting. So a kind of impunity was introduced. Imagine a situation where a government, ran a government for two years, in the face of the constitution, refused to give account, which is in, in, a, in an association as, as, as big and the beacon of the society as the BA, you, you run a government of two years, you will render account. So everything was shredded in secrecy, and some lawyers insisted that until things are done openly and clearly, that uh, we won't take it. So uh, one thing led to the other, and then uh, lawyers insisted that the election was not going to take place. Some people went and swore themselves in and purported to be the government, and then they were resisted. Until uh, um, the NBA National also waited in at the time. Set up, brought in a character committee to resolve the issue. The character committee came and compromised. Also, the people resisted them. So uh, we left it at that until NBA younger members and some elderly members of the branch came together. And then today there is peace. Yeah, um, you listening to that, uh, Clay? Yes, I did. Yes, what's your take? Well, I'm listening to it, they use the word impunity, that they refuse to implement certain sections of the bylaw. If you refuse to implement certain sections of the bylaw, it's only proper that you also take steps to challenge that ESCO, not to wait until when the administration had expired and elections conducted and results announced before you begin to latch on to the fact that um, you claim that there was impunity. But the question to ask is, what is impunity at the end of the day? Because the, the elections held after our annual general meeting. An annual general meeting, you give a report of your stewardship, which the entire house also approved. And the house never said there was any atom of impunity at the end of the day. But be that as it may, I don't like dwelling on the past. The important thing is how to move the bar forward. And we have all come back. and. Um, we're on the right track right now. And, and um, as a, 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 a candidate in that election, you are satisfied with what is going on right now to return peace to the bar? Well, I wouldn't want to stick to what my opinion is. What is important is what is best for the branch. And the best thing for the branch is that we are back and we have started. And that is also the best thing for the society because our branch is a very vital branch of the bar. And um, we're interested in protecting the interests of the masses. So for these two years, the impact has been felt. So for the bar, it is better for us to be back together so that we can um, champion certain things that will 
impact positively on the lives of our citizens? Yes, uh, um, we, we, at, at the risk of uh, dwelling on the past, uh, don't you think that that incident created some degree of disappointment among the people who, many of whom uh, uh, hold the, uh, the lawyers and the NBA in very high esteem? Well, anybody who felt disappointed um, had the right to feel like that. But if you belong to a class of people who understand the nitty gritties of the law, for any step you take, they will try to interpret that step in accordance with their understanding of the law. So there are bound to be frictions. But the important thing is how you resolve this friction at the end of the day. And then we have taken steps to resolve them. I think it's a plus for everybody. And we're expecting that elections uh, in the above branch of the NBA will take place. Uh, how soon? Well, um, the ad hoc committee was set up to fine tune the process. So it's for them to see what is on ground and make up their mind when it's most conducive to hold elections. Nobody should be in a hurry to conduct elections until when things are properly done. So you don't repeat the same agitated process all over again. Would you go again? I have a program and I'm just bound to implement that program. So if I discuss with my family, with my friends, and there's need for me to run, why wouldn't I run? Okay, very well. Um, let's, let's look at uh, uh, the, 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 the quality of lawyers uh, that uh, are being produced these days. A number of people have expressed concern. And there's a former, a one-time uh, law teacher. What would you have to say about this concern being expressed by people? Well, the obvious truth is um, people express different worries at the end of the day. People will also tell you the educational level has dropped. People will tell you um, the economy is going down. People will tell you that um, things were better in the past than in the present. It's not peculiar to the legal profession. But don't take it away from any lawyer. Any person that has been called to the bar strictly speaking is a lawyer and he has the capacity to also perform. It depends on the circumstances of his environment. So for me, um, yes, yeah, somebody can say, look, the level has dropped. But if you look at it critically, the performance of these young men in the courts and what they do, you, you wouldn't notice any much difference. So it depends on the person you're interacting with. In any society, you have the cap and those are intelligent. So it's the same thing in any profession. If you interact with an intelligent person of this current generation, you also believe that um, it's a wonderful thing that they are doing. But if you discuss with a crap, you will also believe that the levels have fallen. So it depends on who you're relating with and who you are dialoguing with. I don't want to believe that the levels have dropped. Those who had, um, some of us that got it older, we're not doing better than the younger ones. So what parameter will we use to say that it was better in the past than it is now? So I want to leave it, let's not bother about conjectures. Let there be statistical proof for us to know that it has really dropped. I don't want to say, look, it has dropped or it hasn't dropped. It depends on the person that you interact with. Yes, but some other people feel that uh, these days in, uh, in, uh, in, in the departments of law, uh, some teachers are compromising the standards. The university professor that was seen out of Ife is not of a law faculty. So it's something that is general. That's why I said, in every society, you must have the dregs of the society. In every system, academics, you also have the dregs in academics. It is not peculiar to any particular department or faculty or university. It's a universal thing. Even in the US, you also have the dregs of that profession. So people will compromise at certain levels. But there are those that also stick to what the law says and what their consciences tell them to do. Does that not speak to the fact that some, the, the recruitment of uh, those who teach not just in the law faculty, but also in other faculties, uh, should be re-examined. Well, you're right. Yes, it's proper for the thing to be fine-tuned so that you can at least weed away the bad ones. But you can't be sure how somebody will act until he faces a particular circumstance. They tell you, if you want to know who a man is, give him power. It's only when you've been given power that you will know the capacity of a man to hold on to power. When the lecturer is, is teaching students and he's the one that will also mark their scripts, grade them, you've given me a level of power. It's only when he has had that power that you can now actually say whether he's doing it rightly or wrong. So even if you fine tune the process, you can't be sure you weed out the dregs. 
is something that um, we have to do the best we can and put some checks and balances so that anybody that is caught in the act will be dealt with decisively, just like University of Ife did. Yes, but do you think that the MPA has a role to play in fine-tuning the system of uh, training lawyers and to what extent, if they have, what extent have they been able to do so? I mean, the, the, uh, the MBA's uh, uh, various branches or as a group national. Yes, MBA. MBA has a lot of role to play because um, when they come out from the faculty of law, go to the law school, they also become members of the MBA. It depends on the branch of the MBA and the university involved. With MBA, but we had a good relationship, a wonderful relationship with the faculty of Florida State University. So once in a while, we invite their lecturers to come and um, do certain things for us at the bar level. And in a number of times, they also invite us to the university to also interact and interface with the students. So there's a synergy between the two of them that will positively impact on what is happening. But the bottom line is, students should do their work. If a lecturer misbehaves, don't be afraid. Take steps to report that person. The system has a way of handling such situations. You mean the student should... Uh, should report, yes, the lecturers, yes. And you think that student is safe? It's very safe. Very safe. A number of students have taken... After all, the, the, the student at the University of Ife, what happened to her? Nothing, absolutely. But, it, but it's one, one, a one-offish thing. I agree it's a one-offish thing. That person has done it and nothing happened. I also know when I was in the university, some students have also reported some lecturers and university investigated and found that their complaints were right and those lecturers were punished. You don't expect that the vice chancellor or the senate of the university will sit down and know what lecturers are doing. It's only when complaints are made that you can afford to deal with those complaints decisively. So if the students, out of fear, which is not justified, decide not to report their lecturers, well, what can anybody do about it? So it's to encourage the students, and particularly these are law students, these are, these are people who are training to be lawyers. So they should not be afraid of taking certain legal steps. You cannot be afraid of taking certain illegal steps if you're a lawyer. So they should take steps to report their lecture if the need arises. So in other words, um, what you are saying is that uh, um, what, what you are seeing in the universities is also a reflection of uh, what's happening in the, in, the, in the environment generally. It's worse in the environment. The universities are better. So what would you, what, of course, the teachers in universities are products of the environment, aren't they? Just like all of us, you're a product of the environment, I am. Yeah. But outside that, we also have our personal principles and we have our religious principles. Most of these lecturers, given your level of intellectual development, you begin to ascribe value to things that are not mundane. At that level, you can say this is right and you stick to it. So education has a way of shaping you in doing certain things. Certain professions have a way of also shaping you. So it is worse in the society than it is in the university. Okay, so what, do you, what would you prefer as solutions to this? Is, is, it, is it a matter of values? What, how would you uh, approach it if you, are to, if you are to comment or to advise on how we can improve on the situation in the environment? It's a systemic thing. It's a systemic thing. It's something that has to do with the system. If we want to change, we must introduce some changes in the system. And these changes is better if it is done from the top. I'll give an example. If you're running this particular place and by 8 o'clock you're in the office, your subordinates will be here before 8 o'clock. But if you're running this office and you're here by the normal opening time is 8 a.m., and you have by 10, your subordinates cannot come by 8. So it starts from the head. If we can take care of the head, the society will key in. And I will give up, I will use Abad as an example. Abad is one society that is easy to control, very easy to control. People are willing to abide by the rules once you're determined to enforce those rules. The average Abad man will respect the rules if you're determined to enforce it. But if you're lax about it, of course, they'll take advantage of it and they'll tell you to your face there's something you can do. But any day they know that you're willing to enforce those regulations, they will keep behind you. So if we really want to introduce changes, I will give you an example. If, if you take a, you know, a trip to my secondary school, comprehensive secondary school, the day I went to that school, I went. That school is almost closed. The old boys, we have come together and see how we're going to revive that particular school. It's the same thing with almost all the public educational institutions that we have. And 
most of us attended these public schools. If you attend any of these private schools and you go to a public school, ask of the quality of teachers you have in these public schools. I took a step and I went to a Henry Primary School, interacted with teachers. I discovered a lot of those teachers had a master's degree. The least qualification you get is NC. But I visited another private school, I won't call the name, and I discovered that the most qualified had an NC. But our children now are being taken to where they'll be trained by the less qualified. And what do you expect in the circumstance? Definitely the quality will drop. So it's a systemic thing. And it starts from the head. If we can take care of the head, then we have um, not too much to contend with at the lower level. In other words, you subscribe to the view that the problem of Nigeria is uh, about leadership. That's what it is, precisely. That's what it is. Okay, it's on that note. We'll take a break now. And when we return, this conversation will continue. Don't go away. Subscription, please leave it on channel 7 for a couple of minutes. Stump unplug power cord from the socket. For more inquiry, call us in the on 080-3737-3985 or Ihoma on 080-6382-0685. Or you can call the technical department 081-4018-1602. Or visit our accredited agents around the state. NCO. The word in your home. Do not deface Abia State with posters. Do not defecate on our streets. Do not litter Abia State. urinate in public places. You know chop and go talk. What do you make me do for this one? I say make me do the things where we carry my hands. Now so one one time. I've been having so 
keep Abia State clean. This message is brought to you by the MCL TV. Welcome back to the hot seat on MCL TV. It's good to know you're still there with us. And uh, our guest today has been uh, Bob Bogu, a lawyer and um, a politician. Uh, he contested elections sometime in 2011 yeah. as uh, a governorship candidate of uh, ANPP, right? Yeah, uh, many people feel that uh, the problem of Nigeria is a politician. What's your take? The problem of Nigeria is not strictly speaking the politician, but it's a problem that also involves the led and the leader. The politician and the non-politician are all involved in the process. And if you ask me what I will explain to you. Go ahead. In 2011, I ran for an election. When I ran that election, I never pretended I was going to win the election. I knew the odds were against me. But I wanted to bring certain issues to the front one in the course of the campaign. As at that time, if you pass through any of the roads in Aba, no single road as 20, by 2011 was more trouble from end to end. In some parts of the roads in Aba, you, see, you even see plantain growing, not just plantain, take generation plantain, which means they have had children and grandchildren. So I wanted to bring these things to the fore, and I did. It made Ochendo then to discuss these issues openly, and he made promises about them. So we respected that. I would say, yes, I achieved the bulk of what I wanted to achieve. But if you now take it to the problem with Nigeria, look at a country like Egypt. The Arab Spring, how did it start? It started because the people said, no, enough is enough. And they took steps. And when they took these steps, what happened? Changes. So if the politicians are not doing well, it's for the non-politicians to also organize themselves and say, look, this will not happen and it will never happen. But if everybody is complacent and you go home, what do you expect them to do? They will ride roughshod over you at the end of the day. So in other words, you didn't go into the election with the aim of uh, winning, just uh, flying the kite. Is it? For every contest you go into, you weigh the odds against you. If the odds are stacked against you, 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 you will be thinking as um, somebody who is not analytical to believe that you win. You don't win elections by accident. You win elections through proper planning and you also have the structure and grassroots that will help. And you didn't have those? I had grassroots minimally. Minimally in the sense that AMPB wasn't the party on ground here. So everybody was now moving to either PP Eden or to PDP. So there were a few persons in AMPP. But we galvanized ourselves and said, look, let us see the much impact we can change. My, my belief was to change the paradigm of discussion so that people will make some commitments on what they will do. So that after the four years, you see that and you promise this and promise this, which one have you delivered at the end of the day? Because when the, when the campaigns were going on, Ochendo was not really campaigning. He wasn't telling people what he was going to do. So we decided to tell people what we will do. Believing that people will see it if they buy into it and they vote. To God be all the glory. But if they don't buy into it, you would have changed the paradigm to make Ochendo know that you have to campaign and tell people what the problems are and make promises. Forget this and we'll talk about politicians. Let a politician come and make a promise. I'm going to do this. So that after the four years, you see them asking, just like you played back the tape here now, play back the tape and say, you promised this, you promised this, you promised that, and let him give reasons why he didn't perform and why you should support him as a concern. So that time, my main intention was to bring certain issues affecting ABBA into focus for anybody who, will, who would have won the election then to make promises on those things. And so why didn't you continue with this uh, uh, on, the, on the same platform of trying to raise the consciousness of those who, are, who want to lead to some issues. And you just abandoned it after 2011 as if those problems have been solved. 
Well, after 2011, um, you know, AMPP um, merged with some other, politi other, pol other pol parties to form the APC. And um, I didn't like much what was happening in the APC, so I took a bow and left them. But the, pro the problems for which you joined the, 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 the political party and I tried to go into the election in the first instance had not all been resolved. Well, the obvious truth is um, in a society, society is dynamic and problems at every point in time will always come up. You discuss them and see how you fashion them up. But after the 2011 uh, elections, I, of course, went back to PDP and said, look, let's see how we can grow the state. Let's see how we can change things. Let's see how we can make things happen properly. And you can't compare 2011 to what is happening now. There has been a lot of shift from what it was in 2011 to where we are now. We haven't gotten there, but it's in the process of getting to that place. And you're satisfied with the process? Well, the process, there's one thing I like about process. If you're satisfied with the process, you wouldn't aspire to improve the process. So it's always better to remain dissatisfied with the process so that you keep looking for how to improve on the process. So for me as a person, in any position I find myself, I don't get satisfied with what I'm doing. I feel dissatisfied so that I'll be propelled to do better. So if you assess it from my own perspective, my own personal perspective is that don't ever be satisfied with any process. Otherwise, the process will never develop. Be dissatisfied, that will give you the impetus to think on how you can improve on what you're doing. Yes, going, uh, going by what you just said, it means that Bob will one day get into the platform of another political party to continue the, the struggle. I'm already in PDP and um, I'm sure when the time comes, I will also tell people my intentions. Definitely. Nobody runs away from the battlefield. Very well. Uh, uh, as a politician you are, the Igbo are uh, looking at 2023 for uh, the Igbo presidency of Nigeria or a Nigerian president from the Igbo extraction. What's your take? For anybody who cares to listen, let us not place too much emphasis on becoming the president of Nigeria in 2023. That is not a problem of the Igbo. The Igbo man is structured in such a way that he's very enterprising and entrepreneurial. What we need is restructuring. If we have restructuring and the facilities, infrastructure is developed within this particular southeastern Nigeria, we don't need a president. The North will come here for our technology. The West will come here. Let's even take it a step further. We've been the Senate president a number of times. What, how did he change the circumstance of the Igbo man? We've been the vice president. How did he change the circumstance of the Igbo man? We've had many ministerial slots. How did those positions change the circumstance of the Igbo man? So for me, it's not a function of the presidency. The <laughs> presidency will only, it, it will only affect one particular person and those who are close to him. But we're talking about changing the system so that the Igbos will have enough room for them to manifest their innate capabilities in this country called Nigeria. So for me, presidency is not the issue. The important thing is restructuring. If the presidency will give us restructuring, yes, let's go for it. But if the presidents will not give our restructuring then, let's, let's, let's forget it. And What's your take? It. Will the restructuring give the, Igbo, the presidency from your analysis? The restructuring? Yes. That's why I said if we get restructuring, <laughs> what's my business with presidents? My interest is for Igbo land to develop and feed its people and people will be comfortable. If you go to the US, the state of California has the most functional economy, the most powerful economy in the US. That is the kind of thing I expect in Igbo land. There was um, a World Bank report I read in 1966. As of 1966, this eastern region had more tarred roads than any country in Africa, including South Africa and Egypt. And things were moving on in Southeast. We we're exporting mambo, we we're exporting virtually everything. That is the kind of thing that we need. We need restructuring that will bring the Igbos back to come and develop their place. And once it is done, what is presidency? Presidency is just um, is symbolic. The person goes around. How does it affect the entire enclave known as um, the Southeast? It doesn't in any way. So for me, it's restructuring first. But if the presidency, if we're getting the presidency, if we are sure if we get the presidency, then we'll talk seriously about restructuring. Then I don't have anything uh, against that. But the emphasis should not be on presidency. The emphasis should be of every man should be on restructuring.
driving it a little further, the issue of Ruga. Some people feel that um, we seem not to be understanding uh, the Ruga issue, and that, that Ruga could also be used to develop uh, cattle rearing in the Southeast. Do you subscribe to that? Well, um, the whole policy of Ruga is um, enmeshed in secrecy, which tells you that you have to be careful. Anything that people plan secretly, I'm always very watchful to make sure that it doesn't come to pass. If it's an open thing, they should bring it out, let's also discuss. But I would never support Ruga. And what is my reason? If the entrance of these herdsmen into a community destabilizes the community, why should I allow them to come into Ibolan? There is no place these herdsmen have gone into without creating crisis and problems. And once it happens, that crisis, it has come to stay. What will, are you going to chase them out from the communities they have already checked themselves in? So that's why I'm not supporting Ruga. And when we talk about these herdsmen, people don't understand the deeper implications of this thing. Let me illustrate with an example. I have a sister in law that is unemployed in Abuja. But she decided to go and find some business to do. Somehow she raised money, she acquired a large portion of land, farmed beans. The beans did well, fruited well. One day she came to her farm and discovered that more than 80% of her croppings had been eaten and destroyed by herdsmen. And of course she couldn't even, she, she, she couldn't even um, challenge them because if she tried it, they would have killed her. So you want that kind of thing to come into Igbo land so that when they move from these so-called Uga settlements that are joining farmland, they will also destroy them and people will not talk. They are armed, we are not armed. And information has also been given that uh, for those of us that um, even have arms, they should return their arms at the end of the day. So let's keep the Ruga. And looking at the way Nigeria is structured, a landmass, they have more landmass than us. If the essence of Ruga is to create a place for them to settle, it's just like ranching. So why don't you create it out there in the north? Also give them a portion of the land where you grow grasses and practice irrigation. So there'll be water all, or there will be water for the grass to grow all year round. So why bring it to the southeast? Why take it to the southwest? You have enough land in the, in the north. I don't know whether you've traveled up to the north. You drive for more than 50 kilometers, you won't see any habitation. Full of landmass. So let them take their Ruga to those places. We don't need them here. Okay, you don't need Ruga. But do you think uh, the southeast uh, can also develop ranches for uh, cattle rearing? Yes. Is it possible? Very possible. Ranching doesn't um, entail you're having too much expanse of land. It doesn't entail that. If you go to Brazil, what they do is ranching. And Anambra State, luckily, they have also said they will start ranching, particularly the Efibo, and that's a wonderful one. It's just people to develop interest and go and uh, do the right thing. And um, <laughs> luckily, this part of the, of the world, you can have grass all year round, so you can do proper ranching. And you think that there's a difference between the Ruga settlements and ranching? Of course. Of course. Let's ask ourselves, what is Ruga? Ruga settlement. You're trying to create a settlement where these husbands will come and live in Igbo land. You said you provide schools, provide hospitals, you provide um, other facilities and infrastructure for them to live in that place. What have you done? You have only created a settlement for them within the southeast. And from there, they will begin to move to other parts of the southeast. So that's the difference. But it is ranching. Ranching is a personal business to be run by the state or to be run by an individual not to be funded by the federal government. What is the business of the federal government in? Why don't they come and also um, do ranching for pigs in, in the north? Are people here also interested in going to the north to go and um, grow pigs there if they give us the environment? So why can't they also do it for us there? What's the business of the federal government in um, private business of people? It's just that we don't ask questions in this country. And I don't blame people. Those that will ask questions. Let's, let me not even say those that will ask questions. Those that have the platform to ask questions cannot ask questions because they've been politically exposed. And once you're politically exposed in this country, you, you definitely have one or two skeletons in your company. And if you talk too much, you'll go and extract those skeletons and blow it out of proportion. Even if you don't have skeletons, they'll manufacture one and use the press to level you, just like they did with CJN. So people are careful not to talk. But I'm happy that the masses have said, we don't need this ruler, and so shall it be. Okay, let's come back to your area, your comfort zone, the law. Um, are you not bothered about the delay in the delivery of justice? A number of people have blamed lawyers 
for contributing to this delay in the delivery of justice. Are you bothered? Well, um, for me, it's a conceptual thing. There are some cases I've done. I, don't, I did one land matter before a judge of the High Court of Nigeria State in one year. I had seven witnesses. The other side had seven witnesses. We called on the witnesses and judgment was delivered in good time. But there are some cases, lawyers don't delay cases. What lawyers do is that they follow the law and they make sure that due process is followed. Uh, people will say, look, a lawyer will come and ask for an adjournment. No lawyer goes to court to go and ask for adjournment. But the circumstances can make the lawyer to ask for an adjournment. I'll give you an example. If, let's even say, if it's a criminal matter, the lawyer is defending while the state is prosecuting. Assuming the day the state ought to come with um, its witness, the witness is sick and doesn't come to court, what do you expect the, the, the lawyer to do? The lawyer cannot force the court for that matter to go on. So there will be an adjournment. And anybody who says we said a lawyer, lawyers don't delay cases. What they insist is that due process should be followed. But I believe, just like I said, it's a systemic thing. I was able to do that matter in one year because the civil procedure rules were changed. When they were changed, it fast tracked the process of justice delivery. It's also the same thing that has just been introduced with respect to the um, criminal justice system. The administration of criminal justice act at the federal level and then the administration of criminal justice law at the state level. This will also radicalize the process of um, prosecution so that you can get uh, justice dispensed with faster than in the past. Lawyers don't delay matters. But they come up with, uh, with motions and uh, all that thing, uh, asking for uh, one injunction or another that can uh, uh, extend the process. And uh, maybe that's what you call uh, um, due, due process. Is that, does, that, uh, does, that really, does that really tally? Does it, does it give us the necessary uh, strength to ensure that justice is, deli is delivered uh, uh, on time? Let us not um, make the mistake of um, believing that if justice is delivered fast, that it amounts to justice. For me, the most important thing about justice is following due process. So that a person will know that he has explored and exploited all the Irrespective of how long it takes. <laughs> That's why I said it's a systemic thing. If it's a criminal trial, let me even you know, restrict myself to a criminal trial now, and you rush justice in one year, and an innocent person is sent to jail, what do you get? You get nothing. If it's a criminal justice system, and an innocent person is let free after three years, what do you lose? So the issue should not be how fast, it's how to make the system to deliver justice. And if you're delivering justice, it will also be justice delivered within reasonable time. The important thing there is reasonableness of the time, not the length of time. But the same justice can as well be delivered at a lesser time, within, within the lesser time. Yeah, can the, be same less. the same justice you deliver, uh, that, is, that can be delivered in three years, can as well be delivered in one year. That's with, what I'm with saying. With all the due process in place. That's what I'm saying. The, 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 understand the bottom line here. The bottom line is not whether it's short or long, but reasonable. Reasonable time within the system. Don't forget I told you that the, the, the civil procedure rules were changed. And for the first 10 years I practiced as a lawyer, I never got judgment on any civil matter. But when the civil procedure rules were changed, in five years, I had more than 15 judgments. How did it happen? Because the procedure was changed and radicalized, and things started happening. Justice came within reasonable time. So that's why they've also looked at the system, the criminal justice system, and they've also introduced this new law now. One of the demands of the new criminal justice system is that uh, magistrates should be visiting the, um, the police cells. Yes, it's there. Yeah, at least uh, monthly. It's there. Um, are you, are you satisfied that that aspect of uh, the criminal justice system is being followed? Well, um, you know, the thing just came into being. People haven't really, really understood all that is involved in that. That is also why I'm happy that the Nigerian Bar Association of our branch is back. There will be an interface between the police and the branch so that these particular aspects of the law will be taken care of. I'm sure we'll get there. How Very soon? Sure. How soon? How soon? Well, now that we are back, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure very soon.
Aba used to be a very, uh, I mean, Aba uh, and Baba. Yeah, we used to be very vibrant. Up to now. And uh, uh, a whole lot of uh, uh, human rights activities handled by the lawyers in Aba. But for the past three years, two years, or two years, if you like, not much is heard. Because of the uh, crisis we had within the period. But luckily we are back now and I'm sure... What would, you, what would you say about um, judicial activism in Nigeria? Well, judicial activism is, um, is a good concept. But we don't have uh, a lot of judicial activists in Nigeria. And um, that's why I keep telling people that what we really need in this country, we don't need strong personalities, we need strong institutions. If the judicial system is strong, then it will encourage judicial activism. But when you have a weak system and strong persons, of course, you dance to the tune of that particular strong person and other system. Or, I, I, or don't you think is uh, as a result of the kind of training you give to lawyers who eventually become judges, and then the, uh, that uh, uh, required activism uh, is, is, is not there? No, it's not really the kind of training you give to lawyers. It's not really. I mean, even the activists we've had in Nigeria were also exposed to the same training, everybody. But it has to do with the system and the conscience of the person. I'll tell you, let me even give you one example. If anybody had told me in my wildest imaginations that one day security agencies will storm the house of um, justice of the Supreme Court, I would tell you it's impossible. I wouldn't have imagined it. If somebody had ever told me in my life that it would come to a point where the CJ will be trapped before the Code of Conduct Bureau, I will say it's impossible. So when you see the fountain, the head has been dealt with decisively. These other persons will say, look, if they can do this to this, why should I be involved in judicial activism at the end of the day? So that's why I said we need to have strong institutions, not strong personalities. And you know, that issue threw up a number of, uh, uh, brought up a number of uh, uh, revelations as regards corruption within the judiciary. How did the issue of um, good no. of conduct, you know, bring up issues of corruption? No, uh, people got to know that uh, judges, some judges are even compromising their, their offices. I still don't get it how. That the CJN was dragged to the Code of Conduct Bureau, how did it um, throw up certain um, corruption issues? It's just one of the issues that uh, be uh, became known that uh, even some judges, some judges, hierarchy, supposedly hierarchy judges, were, were had to be investigated and a lot of things uh, came up as regards uh, their, their official conduct. Well, um, let me restrict it to the issue of code of conduct. What do they do? You ought to um, declare your assets. Not even declare it publicly, just feel the necessary forms and submit. And if you read the act, you will come to terms that what the government did to the CJN was very wrong. The act was not there just to punish people. The act was there to make people uh, declare their assets so that people would know. So I don't see how it introduced the idea of that. The CJN did not declare his assets. There is nothing corrupt about it. It's just that he did not. And the law provides that you send him queries and he will ask if he didn't declare, he will now declare it. So, for me, that whole process shows that, um, that the country is sick, that something needs to be done. But are you denying the fact, are you removing the fact that some judges have compromised their offices? You seem to be not coming up uh, in that regard. Well, um, my background, first of all, is no law. I have my background about regional planning and geography when we deal with statistics. When the statistics don't support a position, I don't, you know, I don't deal on conjectures. Some judges have been investigated, that they've been found that they were corrupt, or there's allegation of corruption, and they are being prosecuted. It's only when they have been convicted that I will now tell you, yes, one or two judges have been convicted, which means that those judges were corrupt. But I give you my word. If you place the judiciary side by side with legislature, and the executive, the judiciary is the least in terms of the corruption index. If you look at the three of them, 
which means even if you even if somebody claims that these people are corrupt, they are less corrupt than all these other branches of um, this, this seven Nigeria we'll talk about. So let us, there is something I've come to realize in this profession, is that anybody who loses a case will never believe that he lost the case because he had a bad case. But he will believe that a judge or judges have been compromised. And for me, that is not the truth. It is, it's possible that um, the judgment can go not the way you want it. If I'm a lawyer, I might have my facts, I might have my law by my side, and I believe that I'll win this case. If I don't win it, if I don't win it, I don't go blaming the judge that he has um, taken money or that he's corrupt. I take it that if I'm convinced on that part of it, I'll take it that either the, the, the judge had a misunderstanding of the law, had a misinterpretation of the law. I'm not going to begin to assume that he must have taken money. I don't. That's one thing I don't okay. know. Can any lawyer tell a client you don't have a good case, let's drop it? I have done it several. And I, I tell you, at least 80% of lawyers do it. If you bring a case to my office, I will look at it and I will tell you, look, you have an obviously bad case. Somebody will tell you, look, my interest for us to prosecute this matter. And at that level, he, what he wants for you to prosecute the matter and bring your professional expert, expertise into the matter, not to win the case, but to do it to the best of your professional capacity. And of course, you get paid for that. Definitely. You're a professional. You get paid for the jobs you do. Even when it does not contribute to societal development? You have introduced a dimension that I like. A case can be obviously bad. But in the course of, you know, prosecuting that particular case, you magnify, you develop and magnify certain principles of law that they were not there, which when the court pronounce or pronounces on them, you will see that those principles of law now become, you know, something that will be incorporated in other issues. So even if a case is, you say, I will not win this case, nothing stops you if your client wants for you to prosecute that case, but do it to your professional capacity. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Bob Ogu. It's been uh, very insightful, and uh, we appreciate uh, your coming to share your thoughts with us. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Chidi, it's so good to see you live. I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. And to you out there, thanks for being with us. We appreciate your time, and we hope you will join us again same time next week when we come back with the hot seat. From me, Chimdi, Oloha, and all of us here in the studio, it's bye-bye.